Is Jesus the one true God? When did he begin to exist? Is he the creator in Genesis 1? And what does Hebrews 1 tell us about these questions? This is part two of a series of videos I'm planning to do on Hebrews 1, where I'll be addressing those three questions and how they relate to six views of the identity of Jesus. In this video, I'll be talking about the chapter as a whole and its purpose in the book. Then I'll focus on verses 8 and 9 to address the question of whether Jesus is called God or not and what the different groups think about that. The whole chapter is aimed at showing how great Jesus is. It starts out by contrasting Jesus with the prophets God spoke through in the past. Most of the rest of the chapter is focused on demonstrating that Jesus is superior to angels. Then at the beginning of chapter 2, we are told why he just spent all of chapter 1 telling us how great Jesus is. The rest of the book expounds on various details relating to the primary purpose that is stated here at the beginning of chapter 2, which I'll read now, starting at verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? The old covenant was given by angels, but the new covenant was inaugurated by Jesus. Much of Hebrews was written as an appeal to people who were alive after Jesus was resurrected, before the Jewish temple was destroyed, to persuade them not to return to the old covenant, but rather to continue under the new covenant, because the new covenant was better and because it came through a mediator who was superior to all the angels. All the contrasts made in chapter 1 that show how much greater Jesus is than the angels are there to drive home the point that we should listen to him and follow him, rather than the old covenant that was given through creatures who are inferior to him. Most people agree that one of the primary functions of chapter 1 is to show the superiority of Jesus over the angels in order to make the case that we should follow Jesus under the terms of the new covenant, rather than the old covenant that was given through angels. Groups who do not believe in the deity of Christ often leverage this fact to strengthen their arguments by pointing out how strange it would be to use all these examples to show that God is greater than angels when it is obvious to everyone that God is greater than the angels because he created them. So why make the case that Jesus is God by showing that he's greater than all the angels when it's obvious that God is greater than all the angels? Now that we have a bit of context for what is going on overall in chapter 1, let's look at verses 8 and 9 and examine what they have to say as it relates to the controversy about the identity of Jesus and the three questions under consideration in this video. The NIV reads this way, But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with oil of joy. Everyone agrees that these verses are about Jesus. The point that is in contention is whether Jesus is called God in verse 8 or not, and if he is called God, what we should think about that. In general, all the groups that believe that Jesus is the one true God think that this verse does call Jesus God, and that this is good evidence from Scripture that he is in fact the one true God, or at least part of the being of God, depending on who you ask. The groups who do not believe that Jesus is the one true God generally have one of two opinions about this verse. Some of them dispute the translation of the verse and argue that it would be better translated as your throne is God, or God is your throne. Others think he is being called God in a different sense. To really understand the second argument, you need to understand the wide range of usage that the word God has in Scripture. There are at least six ways that the word God is used in the Bible. In the vast majority of places in the Bible, the word God refers to the one true God. It is also used to refer to angels, to false gods who are actually dead idols, and to false living gods such as Satan and other fallen angels. A lot of people are aware of those uses, but there are two other less common uses. This includes referring to people as gods who are mighty in some way. This only occurs rarely in Scripture, and the translations often obscure this fact. Ezekiel 32:21 is the clearest example of this that I know of. In this case, it describes a group of dead men as mighty gods. Almost no translations render this phrase as mighty gods. Instead, they usually say something like mighty chiefs. But it's the same word is normally translated as God. The last usage that is not well known or understood is that people are sometimes called gods because they are God's representatives. This last usage is the one that is relevant to the arguments about verse 8 that are made by people who don't believe Jesus is the one true God. Again, this is often obscured by translations. The Old Testament judges are sometimes called gods. This happens twice in the book of Exodus that I know of. 
The translators of the Amplified Bible make this clear in their translation of Exodus 21, 6, which says, Then his master shall bring him to God, that is, to the judges who act in God's name. Then he shall bring him to the door or doorpost. His master shall pierce his ear with an awl, a strong needle, and he shall serve him for life. Most other translations just say either judges or God, without adding the commentary that the judges are actually called gods because they represent God to the people. In Exodus 22.8, the judges are referred to as gods four times. Moses is arguably called God twice in scripture, once in Exodus 4.16 and again in Exodus 7.1. An Israelite king may have been called God in Psalm 45.6. And some unfaithful Israelite leaders were also called gods in Psalm 82. The use of the word God to refer to people in each of these passages is disputed by some, but Jesus makes it clear that in at least some of these passages, people really are called gods in his response to the Pharisees in John 10, 34-36. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? You need to understand two things in order to fully appreciate the argument that the groups who deny the deity of Christ make with regard to the use of the word God in Hebrews 1.8. First, you need to recognize that people can legitimately be called gods because they are God's representatives. Second, you also need to know that the writers of scripture did not use the same conventions we use today to distinguish between the one true God and other gods by capitalizing the G in God. The earliest manuscripts we have are all written in all capital letters with no spaces and no punctuation. So all the capitalization, spaces, and punctuation you see in any Bible you read is all commentary inserted by the translators. It's useful commentary for making it easier for us to read it. However, we do need to know that the differences in meaning, which may exist because these features were inserted into English Bibles to make them more readable, were not present in the originals. It may be that in some cases, additional precision has been added to the text through the translation when there was ambiguity in the original. If it happens that the translator interprets the text correctly and passes on the intended meaning of the text, then that's good for the reader. But if the translator interprets badly and not only obscures the ambiguity, but also inserts a translation that is both clear and wrong, an unsuspecting reader may not recognize that there actually was an ambiguity that has been covered up unintentionally by the translator that is obscuring the true meaning of the text. The main point to take away from these facts is that not only are people sometimes called gods in scripture, but there is no convention in place to make the distinction between the word God being used to describe the one true God or the use of the word for a dead idol or the use of the word for a human representative of God. The only way to know for sure how the word is being used is to look at the surrounding context. It's also worth noting that passages that might call Jesus God are generally not texts that people would use to prove that Jesus is not God on the basis of this use of the word God in scripture. They have other positive arguments to show that only the Father is God and to show the subordination of Jesus to him. They normally argue for their own perspective on the basis of verses like those. Using the argument that Jesus might be called God as God's greatest human representatives is the way they answer claims that Jesus is the one true God based on the claim that he is called God in scripture. I say all this to help you understand the argument made by people who deny the deity of Christ in response to passages that may call him God. They claim that the fact that Jesus may in fact be called God on a small number of occasions in the New Testament does not necessarily mean that he is the one true God. They argue that if the judges, Moses, a king, and some rebellious Israelite leaders were all called gods because they were God's representatives to the people, then surely Jesus could rightly be called God in that same sense because he is God's greatest representative on the earth. They also argue that if he is called God in Hebrews 1.8, then their argument is made even stronger because Hebrews 1.8-9 is a quotation from Psalm 45, 6, and 7, which is the only place in the Old Testament where a human king is probably called God. They make the point that Psalm 45 was not a direct prophecy about Jesus, and that in its original context it was about an Israelite king, probably David or Solomon, who was getting married, because the next several verses in Psalm 45 describe the bride of this king. They argue that since this verse is applied to Jesus in a typological way, 
However, the term God was used in relation to the king in Psalm 45 is the same way that it is used about Jesus. So if the correct translation is, your throne is God, then God is the throne of both the Old Testament king and of Jesus. And if they are both called God, then they are called God in the same sense. They point out that there are several thousand verses in the Old Testament that call God, God, and that the writer of Hebrews could have quoted any of these verses to clearly make that point about him. Instead, he quoted a unique verse in the Old Testament they called a human king God because he was God's representative, and went on to quote the part that talks about the king's God exalting him because of his obedience. They also point out that Hebrews 1.9 applies to Jesus as well, when it says, Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. They might ask questions like these. Does God have a God? Or, and what does it mean for Jesus to have a God? Sometimes during these same conversations, they'll point out that this is not an anomaly in Scripture. There are about 20 places in Scripture where we are told quite explicitly that Jesus has a God. And about half of those we are told that God is his Father. You can see all the verses I know of that say these things in the current slide. These facts make Hebrews 1.8 a very interesting and unusual passage in Scripture because every group can make a positive case for their perspective from the same verse. The groups who believe that Jesus is the one true God have a significant strategic advantage in this particular case because their argument is simple. They can simply argue that Jesus is called God, therefore he must be the one true God. Their argument does not rely on any sophisticated understanding of Scripture. In fact, the less you know about Scripture, the stronger their arguments from this particular passage appear to be. The groups who do not believe that Jesus is the one true God have a different advantage. They might ask why the writer of Hebrews would quote the only passage in the Old Testament that calls a human king God and apply that verse to Jesus if his purpose was to show that Jesus is the one true God. There are thousands of verses in the Old Testament that clearly refer to the one true God with the same term God. Wouldn't it have made more sense to quote one of those verses if he wanted to show that Jesus is the one true God? Combined with the fact that we are told in the next verse that Jesus has a God, makes for an argument that is not easy to refute. Of course, the big disadvantage of their argument is that it requires a lot more knowledge of the Old Testament and the usage of language to even understand what they're talking about. Trinitarians and Benetarians might make a case against modalism on the basis of the words he says at the beginning of verse 8. Typically, they assert that the Father is a speaker who is saying these things about Jesus, which they might argue demonstrates that there is more than one person in the being of God. This might be an unusual place of agreement between modalists, Arians, and Unitarians. They often argue that God is not the speaker in any of the quotations between verses 6 and 12. Everyone agrees that God is a speaker in the quotations from verses 5 and 13, but the original speaker and all the quotes in between are disputed. Typically, Trinitarians and Benetarians argue that God is the speaker in all the quotes, while the other groups are divided, even within a single group, about how to best understand some of the verses. There are three different Unitarian interpretations of verses 10 and following that I know of. I plan to cover this aspect of the controversy in more detail in part three of this series. I plan to include links to some resources on these various perspectives on my website on that subject so you can hear from people who actually hold a particular opinion rather than taking my word for it. I hope this video has helped you understand this aspect of the controversy better. If you enjoyed it, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and visit my website at understandingperspectives.com where you can download any of my resources for free and find useful links to other valuable resources. The Understanding Perspectives podcast should be available on your favorite podcast app if you would like to listen to the audio version of my presentations. Thanks for listening. May God bless you.